Michael Lind, uh, a co-founder of the New America Foundation and uh, policy director of the Economic Growth Program. Uh, and I'm here to welcome uh, Eric Liu to talk about his book, A Chinaman's Chance, uh, One Family's Journey in the Chinese American Dream. Uh, it's a particular pleasure uh, to welcome Eric back. He was president of some of the early discussions uh, that led to the formation of the New America Foundation. And he's been a fellow or a friend off and on uh, uh, for uh, the 15 years or so uh, it's existed. Uh, he has a very distinguished career as a public intellectual and commentator and, and civic entrepreneur. His, his first book, The Accidental Asian, Notes of a Native Speaker, was a New York Times notable book featured in a PBS documentary, uh, Matters of Race. Uh, he is uh, also the author of Guiding Lights, an official book of National Mentoring Month, and co-author of the best-selling Gardens of Democracy. Uh, he's a columnist for Time, a regular contributor to The Atlantic, uh, and uh, he told me uh, before this event that he's uh, founding a new program on citizenship and American identity at the Aspen Institute. So we wish him well about that. Among other things in, in his very distinguished career, he has been a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton. And I want to start our conversation uh, by, by quoting uh, from his book, by far the most consequential speeches I wrote for President Clinton were for the 1994 commemoration of the 50th anniversary of D-Day and the Allied invasion of Normandy. Here was a Gen X son of Chinese immigrants crafting words for the first baby boomer president and a son of the South as he thanked the GI uh, generation and the father he never knew. So that's a remarkable story. Uh, well, Mike, uh, first of all, let me just say thank you uh, for having me. Thanks to the New America Foundation for uh, hosting us and for uh, all of you for coming here today. Um, it's really been great over these 15 plus years to uh, feel like part of the New America extended family and always to get to come back and visit with you. Mike, um, as some of you may know, is um, uh, really one of this country's great thinkers on the meaning of American identity. Uh, one of his many, many books uh, back in, I think, 95 or 96 uh, called The Next American Nation. Uh, is one that really stands the test of time and one that I would commend to you all because it really explores uh, in a very uh, sweeping historical way, cross ethnicities, cross different time periods, uh, some of the questions that I try to look at uh, uh, for Chinese Americans in particular uh, in this book. Uh, um, you know, Mike, that, that story about President Clinton and uh, working on the um, 50th anniversary of D-Day is really fresh in my mind right now. My uh, fiance, Jeanne, uh, who's, who's here today, she and I, uh, uh, six weeks ago, were in Normandy mm -hmm. uh, for the 70th anniversary. We went with a good friend of mine who'd been a fellow speechwriter back then and his wife. And, um, and I'll tell you, going back there now, it was the first time either of us had been back uh, since 1994, uh, was just such a powerful and moving experience to uh, not only, of course, be in the presence of the surviving veterans of D-Day, uh, but to be reminded of some of the larger themes that I was trying to, uh, to, to weave into that passage in the book, uh, the ways in which every one of us here, doesn't matter whether you are of an immigrant generation, whether you are like me, second generation, whether your family's been here for decades or for centuries, uh, what your ethnicity is, the sense that all of us right now, just by virtue of being here today, are beneficiaries, trustees, recipients of this legacy of sacrifice and this legacy of contribution that people long before us uh, have paid into uh, and paid often with blood in their lives. Uh, and D-Day is probably the most um, signal representation of that because this was literally a moment, moment where history pivoted and had D-Day gone the other way, uh, we probably would not be sitting here. We'd be sitting here with different flags and different uh, uh, languages as the kind of uh, the, the way we speak here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> but I, th that sense of obligation and debt to generations past um, to fathers uh, who we either never knew or knew too little in our lives, um, you know, that was very much a, uh, a theme uh, in D-Day and in the commemoration of that event, but it was also a theme and is a theme throughout uh, um, the pages of this book, which really, uh, you know, I, I try to explore both on the level of family story and also on the level of national story, um, what it means to be Chinese American in this moment of China and America, this moment of China versus America increasingly. Uh, and how both at a personal level and just as a citizen, uh, 
uh, I and we reckon with, um, with that balance. Well, tell us a little about <coughs> your family story, which uh, you, you treat very eloquently and poignantly in the book. Yeah, and I, I will acknowledge uh, in, in the first place, uh, my mother, Julia Liu, is here. Uh, my uh, uncle, uh, C.N. Liu, and uh, aunt uh, and cousin uh, are, are all here as well, uh, Amy Liu. Uh, so we've got a great uh, Liu family uh, uh, turnout here. And, uh, um, you know, one of the storylines that is woven throughout this book is just tracing the arc uh, of my own of the Liu family journey. Uh, and you know, I start in many ways with uh, my paternal grandfather, um, uh, whose name in Chinese uh, was Liu Guoyun. Um, and those of you who are Mandarin speakers uh, know that that is a name that Liu is a family name. And Guoyun basically translates to deliverance or destiny of the nation. Right? So a, a big name to a carry. To live up to. A lot to live up to. <laughs> uh, and a name which he did indeed in his lifetime live up to. Um, he was a young man at the time when um, the kind of dynastic rule ended in China and the Republic of China was birthed and uh, became a, uh, uh, entered the military, uh, became a pilot, uh, entered the Air Force of the First Republic of China, fought uh, in the war against the Japanese and then fought uh, later against the, the communists. Uh, and though I never knew him, um, his name, his legend in a way, his visage, I mean just literally his face looking down at me uh, from a very stern portrait uh, in our study at home, uh, very much shaped my sense of um, self, of family, of place, and the sense again of obligation, right? Uh, and what it, it planted the seed of, of a question essentially, which is for me, for all of us now, what does it mean to deliver a nation? Uh, and in my instance in particular, having been born in the United States and raised in the United States, what does it mean to deliver this nation? Um, so it starts a lot with the echoes of that grandfather. And I tell the stories as well of uh, uh, you know, my mother's arrival here in the United States and how arrival stories themselves can be um, told and held in different ways depending on uh, the larger point that, uh, uh, that either one is trying to make or the larger story that America wants to hear. Uh, in that moment. Uh, you know, one way you can tell my mother's story is this kind of classic immigrant story of a, a scrappy young woman who arrived on our shores with very little money in her pockets and through her own wits made her way and um, you know, got, got educated and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are some people who would like to tell that story that way. Uh, but another way to tell it is that by the time she came to the United States, she'd already been educated. She was a graduate of Taiwan's uh, biggest university. Uh, when she came here, she was uh, not a stranger in a strange land. She was greeted and housed by uh, people who were students, former students of her father, who'd been a professor uh, in China and Taiwan. And so she arrived on these shores, if not with a lot of money, with a lot of social capital already, mm -hmm. uh, with education, with relationships, with, 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 uh, and yes, with her own wits and wherewithal. Uh, one of the emblematic stories that I tell in the book for my mother is um, that uh, one of her early jobs was as a file clerk. Uh, at a company in Manhattan, uh, which still exists to this day, I think, called Chock Full of Nuts, a coffee company. Uh, and she was a file clerk and, uh, um, you know, with a decent command of English and just kind of learning her way um, uh, through and doing her job. And uh, as she worked uh, there at Chock Full of Nuts, this a kindly older executive, an African-American man, uh, sort of just, you know, looked out for her uh, and asked his secretary to look out for her and make sure that my mom, um, you know, knew how to um, navigate the, the corporate structure and uh, made sure that everything was working out okay for her. Uh, and it wasn't until years later after she'd left the company that she learned that this uh, older executive, Mr. Robinson, um, was actually Jackie Robinson, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who in his retirement from baseball had gone to chock full of nuts just to, to be a senior executive. And uh, so you can tell that kind of story and think, wow, immigrant woman come hearing, coming here with nothing, touched by this mythic American you know, in this kind of, again, destined path to claim this country. Uh, yes and no, right? I mean, yes, that all of that is true, uh, but the reality is that for my mother and for many other people, I think in Chinese America, uh, many Asian Americans in general today, um, I think the national narrative about Chinese Americans in particular and Asian Americans in general uh, neglects the fact that so many people, like my mother, like then me in the second generation, who've been able to arrive and achieve uh, and, and do things in this country. Um, yes, we had our own motivation and our skill and our wits about us, uh, but we also arrived here with tremendous advantages to begin with. 
Um, and when people talk about this model minority stereotype uh, that prevails about Chinese and Asian Americans, um, they often forget the ways in which having that starting endowment of social capital, having an education already, having already an expectation uh, that you would enter into a profession um, gives you a huge leg up in arriving even to a new country. Um, and that there are, even today in, in the Chinese American community, uh, nearly half a million people who are living in poverty. Chinese Americans living in poverty, not just brand new migrants, but people in multi-generational poverty whose stories are not part of the picture, who do not fit the model minority stereotype. And well, the, the late uh, <coughs> Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York, mm -hmm. he's a great social scientist in his own right, uh, he made that point repeatedly that th this myth that everyone arrived at Ellis Island completely amnesiac and not knowing anybody and then they all worked their way up, that if you looked in, in his case, he and Nathan Glazer studied European ethnic groups in the United States. And there were divisions within the ethnic groups between what were called the Lace Curtain Irish and the Shanty Irish. And you see this uh, uh, in Chinese Americans and, and other groups. And that gets left out of both of these somewhat contradictory stories. One is the model minority, mm -hmm. where everyone's uh, you know, got this or that set of skills. Uh, and the other is the traditional Ellis Island narrative, where people arrive amnesiac and destitute, mm -hmm. right? And then just completely reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. No, I think in both cases, you're absolutely right. What is neglected is class. What is neglected is the endowments of class. And <clears throat> you know, having this conversation right now um, in this moment where America is stretched apart, you know, pulled apart centrifugally by some of the most radical and severe income and wealth inequality <clears throat> that we've seen, period, in our history, certainly over the last 100 years, uh, means that this conversation about Chinese Americans, this conversation about race and American identity, um, can't just be about race. Uh, we have to begin to see the interplay uh, of class and race and see the ways in which advantages acknowledged and unacknowledged uh, form and open up paths for um, people like my family and, uh, and many other stories. Well, let's talk about something you deal with uh, in the book and, and the geopolitics of it, the changing view of China from our ally in World War II to a peer competitor, as the Pentagon would call it today. Uh, one of the interesting things you find if you look at the history of immigration in the U.S. is at any given time, much of the immigration to the U.S., tends to come from the country which is the geopolitical rival of, of that particular era. So in the early American Republic, it was Britain, right? There was the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and English immigrants were uh, among the largest groups. Uh, you know, then you had German Americans uh, being the dominant, to the extent that the, the single largest ethnicity among white Americans to this day is, is uh, German Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had the two world wars, which created uh, uh, anti-German backlash in World War I, which had pretty much abated by World War II, so that you had the Pacific Fleet commanded by uh, Chester Nimitz, a German-American, and, and Dwight Eisenhower, another German-American, commanded D-Day. Uh, and what has often happened is, and I, I, w I wonder what your thoughts about this are, as, as the, the rising power, uh, be it Britain industrializing in the 1800s, Germany in the late 1900s, uh, uh, maybe China now. As it develops, uh, it, it was often an authoritarian regime, or in the case of Britain, one where the aristocracy restricted upward mobility. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of the, the talented upper middle class, the educated elites, either were forced out as exiles, as in the case of Germany, or, or they fled for opportunity, like, like the British. Uh, then as the country develops, but also democratizes, you know, then the immigration tends to, to dry up. Uh, you know, uh, do, do you think there are parallels there with, with uh, what's happening in uh, uh, China? Now, obviously, your family came after World War II right. and during the Cold War. Right. Uh, but there are reports in the press uh, uh, that a lot of uh, uh, successful Chinese are, are trying to transfer wealth abroad, trying to get green cards. Well, that, uh, that is, <coughs> I think, in the broad historical scope, and by the way, I mean, one of the reasons why I, I commend to you Mike Lynn's books, including The Next American Nation, is uh, th this is the closest thing you will find on Earth uh, 
to a walking Wikipedia. Well, we're, we're uh, interviewing you here. Yeah, you I know, know. But, but Mike is, I mean, pretty much any topic on anything, Mike has a reference and a source, and I love learning from Mike and talking about things. And, you know, that, that broad historical scope, um, you know, that's, that is an interesting thing. I hadn't thought about it that way. I, I suppose it is quite true that the pattern is holding today, even as China is rising, there is a layer of Chinese elite who certainly are sending their children to the United States to get educated, are trying to move assets uh, to the West, to the United States in particular, um, uh, and uh, you know, if, no, if for no other reason than as a hedge, uh, a hedge against instability and chaos that might still unfold uh, in China. But I think there's a larger underlying theme to each of those historical examples you're describing, uh, which really brings us to this moment right now. And that is that from the beginning of the Republic, even when our immigrants were mainly English, uh, uh, coming to, you know, uh, quote, assimilate among other, essentially, third generation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I I Englishmen, um, that, that from those early days all the way through today, what has been this country's competitive advantage in the world has been our openness, has been not just the literal legal openness of our borders, um, you know, the millions upon millions of Irish and German and Italian and other European immigrants who uh, came here, you know, you wouldn't call it illegally then because there was no particular immigration law, but you would certainly call it uninvited by our government, right? <laughs> uh, uninvited by law, uninvited by official uh, uh, United States, uh, that throughout the history of this country, the cultural openness to these new arrivals and then the openness of our cultural operating system uh, to welcome these folks in, to uh, take the strands of their styles, their voices, their approach to, to uh, problem solving their cultures uh, and, and, and mesh them and weave them into a new form of Americanness. Um, that story is still playing out today. Uh, and I think that this is, again, our competitive advantage in the United States if we don't blow it. Well, and and that, this, this is a really big if. This is the thing that I really want to underscore, Mike, which is that as great as China is becoming and as powerful as it is, and you know, some people estimate that by the end of this year or next year, China's GDP will surpass that of the United States, a sea change is happening, and, and nothing in particular that we do is going to, uh, to, to change that. I don't care. No matter how great and surpassingly large China's GDP gets, we have this advantage that I boil down very simply this way. America makes Chinese Americans. China does not make American Chinese. China does not want to, does not know how to, is not interested in. It's not the point of China to take immigrants from America or Europe or Africa or Ireland or wherever it may be and fuse them into uh, you know, a culture and a welcoming spirit and allow them, empower them to change the very meaning and definition of Chineseness. That's not what goes on there, but that is what goes on here. It is the very point uh, of here and it, it has always been the point going back to all the historical examples that you're citing. I think that's very important, and it's something that I think all of the societies of East Asia, including the Japanese and, and the Koreans and the Taiwanese, that they, they, they still just cannot imagine people from different groups, unless it's very similar countries. There, there's a little story uh, I tell in this book. It's not even about China. It's about Japan, uh, which I learned from a, a colleague uh, um, who's a journalist uh, who is, I suppose, fourth generation Japanese American. He's a Japanese American great-grandmother. Uh, but his name is Leslie Helm. He, he, he's German last name. He looks like his German grandparents and great-grandparents. And um, he wrote a great book called Yokohama Yankee uh, about his German family going to Japan 150 years ago and becoming traders and getting established there and how that legacy flowed into his life. He told me the story, Leslie did, uh, about how um, I think in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when Japan was facing a labor shortage because of their low birth rights, rates, they were trying to figure out, okay, how do we bring in guest workers? And this is a country even more than China that is, as you say, so focused on cultural and racial purity uh, and so resistant to outsiders uh, uh, coming in that they thought, well, instead of getting, um, you know, Pakistani or other South Asian uh, guest workers, as ha happens in a lot of the rest of the world, um, we have an idea. Let's go find, it turns out there's a large population of ethnic Japanese in Brazil. Uh, because of earlier generations of immigration from Japan to Brazil. So there's this large community of Japanese Brazilians. Let's invite them back to Japan, right, to be <coughs> guest workers. And so they did this grand experiment, and they invited thousands of Japanese Brazilian guest workers. Uh, and guess what happened? What happened was that even though they were ethnically Japanese, even though in most cases they could speak fluent Japanese, uh, they completely were rejected by the host body. This transplant did not work because they were culturally Brazilian. 
They barbecued meat in the you know you know in their apartments. They created set on set you know kitchens on fire. They danced and partied in ways that were just not kind of you know known or accepted in in the little you know cramped communities in Tokyo. And there was just this whole culture clash. And they were like, but wait a minute, you're Japanese, and no, I'm Brazilian, right? And uh, and I think there again, this uh, an instance uh, of the ways in which. Uh, America, for all our many manifest faults to this day, and all our continuing failures, you need look no farther than the southern border uh, to live up to our promise of openness. For all our failures, we that doesn't happen, right? We we, we uh, the, the body does not so actively and regularly uh, reject transplants, uh, and we don't have this kind of immune system here that kicks out anything that uh, uh, is not of the body. But the, you talk about the Han Chinese, the ethnic majority in, in China, but it actually did grow through gradual assimilation as well as natural demographic growth, right? O over, uh, and you had the imperial system and you had Confucianism, which you, you write about at great length. A mm -hmm. uh, uh, very fascinating subject. So, uh, so what are the continuities in Chinese culture between pre-modern China and 21st century China? Well, I. I do not, uh, in the pages of this book, pretend to be uh, an authority on Chinese civilization. But what I do claim is that as a second generation Chinese American, as a son of immigrants who uh, has grown up um, at least saturated in or suffused by certain values and norms and styles and mores uh, that you could call Chinese, I do, in a sense, throughout the pages of the book, try to peel that apart and ask what part of me is Chinese, and what is the essence of that Chineseness? Um, and a, a good measure of it does have to do with uh, um, what turns out to be Confucianism. I, I didn't, you know, we, we did not have a household where we talked about Confucius, or, uh, you know, I didn't read the Analects of Confucius till I was in college in a uh, chi modern, you know, in a Chinese history course, and I read it in English translation. And quite frankly, as I say in the book, I found the English translation very weird and dull and stultifying and kind of just kind of ill-fitting. Uh, and I thought the whole thing was a little bit um, uh, just anachronistic. Uh, but several things have happened over my life to make me dive back deeper in. Uh, and I suppose the most basic one is becoming a father in my own right. Um, uh, uh, but, I, but the second one probably is uh, the passing of my father uh, 23 years ago. Uh, and both of those things made me think a lot about the nature of inheritance the nature of what we pass on in terms of our values and our norms and our beliefs. And it just turns out um, that so much of the way that I am both kind of constitutionally wired, I suppose, but also the values that I hold dear um, and what I try to pass on to my daughter, who's a teenager now, what I try to practice in my work uh, on American citizenship, which is a lot of the work that I do when I'm not writing, um, values of mutual obligation, of reciprocity, of understanding that we are woven into a web of relationship and expectation all the time. Values uh, that set us into a larger historical context. Values that deny us the opportunity just to say, I am a sole individual cut off from history, reinventing myself without regard to anybody else around me. That all these values are in different ways uh, in one kind of uh, uh, cultural strand or another, Confucian, right? Uh, and that my belief, for instance, in the context of talking about American citizenship, that rights are not just rights. That every right we have under the Constitution, every right we enjoy as Americans, can and should and must, if we're to, to remain a healthy grown-up country, be coupled with a set of responsibilities. Right? That rights are duties. Rights are not just set off by duties. Rights are duties. That if you have a right to bear arms, you have a duty to bear arms responsibly. If you have a right to free speech, you have a right to exercise that speech responsibly, that, you have a, that, that, that these things are woven together, that is a Confucian ethic, right? And, uh, and, and so one of the great joys of even writing this book was just to see the ways in which I was magne magnetically drawn to certain Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, you know, Francis Hutcheson or David Hume or others. Uh, uh, but the reasons why I was drawn to them was uh, because of these little seeds of Confucian ethics uh, that had been planted in me, uh, you know, again, often without often without express articulation. Well, just and in the they, way were, that we they were pushing back against this extreme Lockean individualism. That's right. You know, and, and Locke is a great thinker in, in many ways, but he really is weak on social duty. Yes. You know, at one point, uh, 
he explains that the reason soldiers fight in wartime is fear of punishment by their commanding officers. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> it, it's this very transactional, you know, materialistic, individualistic sort People of thing. People often forget. So Adam Smith, who we often cite as the guy who wrote The Wealth of Nations and gave us the metaphor of the invisible hand for our marketplace, and is often cited by modern-day free market fundamentalist individualists uh, as their hero and kind of lodestar, um, people forget his second, in, in some ways, more consequential book, which was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And The Theory of Moral Sentiments is exactly what Mike is talking about here, the ways in which bonds of affection and trust and mutual obligation and reciprocity, they are the glue that make anything work. They, make, they are the glue that make a market work. They are the glue that make a community work. They are the glue that make a family work. They are the glue that make a nation work, right? And, um, and so the part of me that is drawn to theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith, rather than wealth of nations, Adam Smith, um, you know, is a strongly Chinese uh, part of me. And, and I would say in this moment right now, to, to the earlier part of your question, the opportunity that America has today, when I said that America makes Chinese Americans and China doesn't make uh, American Chinese, that's not just a statement of demographic you know, curiosity or fact. It, 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 again, what it is is a charge and a challenge to American society. And the question is, can American society embrace Americans of Chinese descent, whether first, second, third, fifth generation, in ways that don't force them to assimilate to some other pre-existing white wasp way of behaving? To the extent that Chinese, that, to the extent that the United States embraces Chinese Americans but forces them to kind of become white, um, then we are completely undercapitalizing uh, on this opportunity. If, by contrast, the United States, in, in our practices and laws and norms and culture, uh, embrace the ways of being, the ways of leading, the styles of conversation, the styles of leadership that Chinese Americans can bring to the table, um, which may not seem classically Dale Carnegie, sell yourself, get out there, you know, may not seem uh, classically extroverted or self aggrandizing in the way that a lot of American uh, business and society likes to reward, um, then American culture will be enriched. Right? And I think this is, uh, this is our challenge and our opportunity right now. Well, one of the uh, basic aspects of Confucianism that's always fascinated me is, is this reverence for learning, for education, which you actually don't find in the West because in, in recent centuries, the West has been more economically developed and, and, and more scientific than uh, Asia and other parts of the world. But historically, if you look at the, the two main influences on Western culture, you get uh, Christianity, which says, you know, like the wisdom of the Greeks is the foolishness of God. And, you know, there's, there's sort of an anti-intellectual uh, strand there, though not in all denominations. Uh, and then there was this kind of European, British, upper class mentality where it's all about pedigree and birth and uh, the upper classes are good at war and hunting animals and you know, uh, uh, the lower classes write books. Uh, as as uh, the, the king supposedly said to Edward Gibbon when presented with a presentation copy of uh, the rise and, and fall of the, Brit of the Roman Empire, another damn fat, thick book. Hey, Mr. Gibbon, scribble, scribble, scribble. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and I was thinking about that when I was in Vietnam a few years ago, and there was a Buddhist temple, it was supernatural, and then there was a Confucian temple. So I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Confucian temple, what would be in the Confucian temple? So they had uh, row after row of these stelae, these big tombstone-like carven stones from the Middle Ages. So I asked my guide, you know, what was that? And he said they were diplomas. That is, when someone passed the, the Confucian examination in Vietnam, which at that time was, was modeled, you know, looked to China for, uh, as a cultural model, they engraved, the family had such pride that they engraved the name in stone. And so here you have, you know, 900 or 1,000 years later, essentially the diplomas, mm -hmm. right? At a time when uh, uh, my European ancestors were, at least in Scandinavia, sacrificing human beings and <laughs> along with goats and so <laughs> on and, and, you know, a bunch of warlords. Yeah. Uh, so so that's, that's a cliche which has some foundation in, in truth, isn't it? The you know, respect for learning? The, it is, and uh, you know, any time you begin to explore and try to peel the onion of what is Chineseness, what is Americanness, what is the Chinese aspect of Americanness, you, you, you can 
you can go down the road of lapsing into cliche. Um, it's certainly true that late in this book, I, I, I cite a, um, um, uh, a work by an uh, education psychologist, a uh, Chinese immigrant named Jin Li, uh, and the book is called The Cultural Foundations of Learning, East and West. And there's a part of her book where she has these two columns. One is European-American modes of learning and engaging, and one is um, Chinese modes of learning and engaging, right? And, uh, and both columns are filled with exactly what you would expect to be cliches. Um, on, on the European-American side, it's about individual achievement. It's about um, you know, g g drawing attention to oneself. It's about um, uh, you know, racking up uh, uh, knowledge in order to uh, deploy it in the world. Uh, on the Chinese uh, side, it's about uh, acquiring knowledge uh, um, in order to perfect oneself morally. It's about kind of reverence for learning for the sake of learning. It's about, um, you know, uh, again, this sense of relationship and obligation. And you look at these two columns and you can say, oh, these are very kind of broad generalizations. And yet, as she herself writes in this, you know, 500-page book, um, there is a core of truth to both of these sets of cliches, right? And uh, part of the thing that we get to and have to do as Americans uh, is we get to mix and match our cliches. We get to mix and match the different strands of cultural identity uh, and influence. And we get to uh, borrow uh, things that we think are most adaptive from one culture or another. Um, uh, and, you know, the, and maybe shed the parts that are least adaptive. Right? The, the Confucian reverence for learning, um, like so many aspects of Confucianism, um, got stultified. It became ritualistic. It became very oppressive. Uh, it became literally and kind of figuratively legalistic, right? Just following rules for the sake of following rules. Um, and that's why for, um, you know, my mother's father, uh, for instance, who was a professor in, of European history uh, in that time of, uh, in China, part of what is called the May 4th movement of reform in the early uh, years of, uh, of the Republic there, um, um, had a, a strong distaste for the Confucian legacy in the sense that Confucianism was what used to hold back China, right? So it is possible to see in that legacy, as much as in the American legacy of individualism and individual imagination, excesses um, that become maladaptive, excesses that stifle the society, right? And what we, again, get to and have to figure out as Americans is how do we take the best of these traditions? How do we kind of select uh, the, the, the most adaptive aspects of being Chinese, uh, being Scandinavian. Uh, you know, I live in Seattle, which is about as pure a distillation of an Asian Scandinavian society and fusion as you can find on Earth, right? And you get this melding of ways uh, that makes Seattle a very communitarian place, a very, a place where people do not, are not flashy, are not trying to draw attention to themselves, uh, a place where there is a spirit of mutuality uh, and family and obligation, uh, and, uh, and that's very different from, say, where you grew up in the South or where I grew up in upstate New York. Um, and you know, how we kind of borrow these strands and weave them into the most adaptive hybrids uh, is the American question. Well, you'll be pleased to know that the actor who played Charlie Chan, Warner Oland, was Swedish. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, a great uh, American story, I suppose. Uh, uh, well, why don't we open it up to uh, uh, questions, comments from the audience. Uh, again, welcoming uh, uh, Mrs. Liu, uh, uh, the Liu family uh, in the audience. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, stimulated by this discussion? Yes. Uh, I'll take a microphone. I'd like to have you discuss how you um, decided on the title, given that some of your you know, preface remarks seem to say that you did come from a relative degree of privilege, education, social standing, ties, uh, and yet the phrase or the term, you know, he doesn't have a Chinaman's chance, to means totally the opposite, that he had no way of succeeding, uh, and yet your story seems to be the opposite of that. It's a great question. Um, so the, the back story of the title itself of the book, um, I actually tell on the opening pages of the book, um, my father, uh, when he came to the United States was a real, um, he loved language. He was a real sponge for uh, slang and idiom and, uh, and just the way that people talked. And somewhere early along the way, you know, he came here in the late 1950s, he, he heard someone use this phrase, a Chinaman's chance. Uh, and somewhere along the way, he understood that that was a phrase um, 
you know, to be used against people like him, right? Uh, it is a phrase, for those of you who don't know, that has its origins 100 years earlier in the 1850s when Chinese immigrants first started coming to the United States in large numbers. And, uh, and whether it was in laying the tracks of our transcontinental railroad or mining our mountains, uh, these Chinese laborers were given the most thankless, dangerous, life-threatening tasks uh, so that a figure of speech arose that, uh, um, you know, you've got a Chinaman's chance of surviving, right? Uh, and that figure of speech survived, ironically, uh, long after the era that gave it birth. Uh, uh, and so that by the time of the 1950s, when my dad got here, it was still in popular enough usage that, uh, that he'd heard it. By the time I was a kid and was growing up, uh, my father did what I think is a great American act. And I don't mean great in the sense that history you know, books record it, but I mean great in the sense of this is the essence of what it means to be American. He took a word or a set of ideas that were meant to be used against him and he reappropriated them. And he flipped them around and he turned them upside down. So he started to take this phrase and to use it at home in a joking, ironic sense, just on applying it to everyday prosaic situations. Oh, it's you know, the ninth inning of this baseball game. The Yankees have a Chinaman's chance of you know, winning this game. You know, they're behind by five runs. Or if we were trying to get to the grocery store before closing, you know, but, it was, you know, but we were 15 minutes away. Oh, you've got a Chinaman's chance of getting there on time. You know? And so my father would just uh, do this in a joking way, and by doing so, essentially teach me some bigger lessons about how wit can, can, can neutralize malice, about how new Americans can claim language and change the meaning of that language, right? Uh, and, and so th that's number one about why I use that phrase. Uh, but the second reason, uh, even apart from that particular family story, um, is that, again, part of the thesis uh, the, the argument here of the book is that, um, you know, the key words that I said in my remarks earlier were, were, if we don't blow it, right? That America has this advantage, has this open cultural operating system um, that fuses the best of all different cultures around the world, if we don't blow it, right? And that means if we don't lapse into fearful restrictionism, if we don't lapse into isolationism, if we don't lapse into, um, you know, racial antagonism, uh, you know, in, in our society. Uh, if we preserve the spirit of open hybridity that has always made this country what it is. Uh, and so to me, a good bellwether in this moment where China is rising and its rise scares many Americans, um, a good bellwether for whether America is doing its job uh, and succeeding at its design is whether people in this country of Chinese descent find that their chances for success, for opportunity, for voice, for fulfillment, for power, are most best expressed here in the United States than, say, in China, right? If people like me, people like my friend Scott Tong, you know, who I grew up with, you know, second generation or other generations are um, finding that, gosh, you know, it's way more attractive to pull up stakes and just go to China and seek my fortune there and raise my family there uh, because that's where it's at right now, then America will have failed. America will have failed at its fundamental purpose, right? And, and indeed, this is part of the story uh, th that I tell throughout the context of my family. Um, uh, several of my uncles who came to the United States and came here and got great educations and came here and got good jobs but found uh, during the 80s when Taiwan began to rise that, wow, it was actually more attractive to go back to Taiwan uh, and to make uh, a go at it there, right? I look at that and I'm very proud uh, of the success that they achieved in business and in education and in politics in Taiwan uh, and from a Liu family perspective, that's a great thing. But from the vantage point of my country, as an American, I think that's a darn shame, right? It's a darn shame that this country did not, was not magnetic enough to hold them here and did not create enough opportunity so that their fullest sense of potential and voice and power would have been channeled into American life. And so um, I, want that, I want that chance, uh, which once was denied to people called Chinamen, um, to flower to its fullest extent here uh, so that um, people of Chinese or any other ethnicity find that uh, uh, the place where they can be their fullest selves is still here. Will, th will there be a permanent Chinese diaspora culture? The reason I ask that is if you look at the very populous Western countries and also uh, Mexico, uh, if it had not been destroyed deliberately during World War I, there would still be a huge German language infrastructure here. You know, there's a Spanish language. And it just seems to me that given the scale, 
and, and the size of the, the Chinese diaspora, that that would be a permanent feature. So even as, as some Chinese Americans assimilate, you would have immigrants and, and you would have this uh, uh, infrastructure that's kind of bilingual, bicultural in the, in the way that you have now, particularly with Spanish, the, the, the Spanish speaking subculture. So two quibbles I would make with the premise of the question of, of word choice. Uh, one is assimilate uh, and the other is diaspora. Um, so um, let me say a word about each of those. So I don't believe that the watchword of our time here in 2014 is assimilate or assimilation. I don't believe that Amer the point of America is to assimilate immigrants in the sense that, um, you know, mold them to a pre-existing uh, form. Okay, um, uh, that, that, let's just put linguistically. Yeah. Right, so third generation Latinos often to speak no Spanish whatsoever. I'm just speaking about Oh, that's to totally that's true. Right. Yeah, uh, so, so that, that I agree with. But, but I would say acculturate more than assimilate, right? right. right? Because even as, they, even as those third generation Latinos, or in the case of my daughter, third generation Chinese Americans, begin to lose fluency and command in you know, that heritage language, uh, they are at the same time changing the baseline of America, right? Um, Hispanic immigrants are changing the baseline of our politics, of our culture, uh, 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 of our media, right? Uh, Chinese Americans are as well. Um, uh, so, so that's number one. But the diaspora point, I think, is an even more important one to really for us to chew on together here. Um, I resist in some ways the idea of Chinese diaspora. I also resist in, in particular the phrase and the idea of overseas Chinese. This is a phrase that is said and heard a lot um, in, in the news, in global affairs, in you know, not just in the context of American life. The idea that, um, that you're, you're either Chinese in China or you are an overseas Chinese, right? And if you're an overseas Chinese, uh, you are simply a, a, a member of the mothership society who happens to be somewhere else, right? Um, and that member of the, you know, that notion um, uh, has some cultural truth to it. Uh, certainly if you look throughout Southeast Asia, um, you see Chinese minority communities that essentially have stayed isolated and stayed linguistically and culturally coherent and, uh, and have neither wanted to nor actually been allowed to acculturate and integrate into the wider society of Malaysia or Indonesia or the Philippines or uh, Singapore, what have you, right? There's some truth to that. But um, even if there's some truth to that in other places in the, in the world, again, the point of this place in the world, the United States, uh, is not to treat um, people as essentially guest visitors from a mothership diaspora, whether Chinese or Jews or Germans or whatever, uh, but to treat them as Americans, Americans of another variety, right? Uh, and so two points of terminology that I often um, uh, make a point to, uh, to, to express. Um, one is I, I label myself Chinese American without a hyphen. I don't hyphenate because to me the hyphen uh, I, I say Chinese American. American is the noun, and Chinese is the adjective, or an adjective. It is one of many adjectives that I, I could use to describe my identity, right? I'm Asian American. I'm a progressive American. I'm a short American. I'm a baseball-loving American, right? I mean, there, there, there's many adjectives there, but American is the noun, and by my presence, I am changing the noun, right? Uh, but the hyphenation to me, a Chinese hyphen American, signifies something very different. To me, the hyphen is appropriate in usage when you're talking about an interplay between two parties, between two nations. Chinese hyphen American trade. Chinese hyphen American diplomacy. Chinese hyphen American military conflict, right? Um, between China and America. Um, I'm not a hyphen. I don't reside in the hyphen. I'm an American who's redefining American by my, by my and by my family's presence here. Uh, the, the, the other kind of grammatical quibble that I have is with the, there, there's a phrase that many Chinese Americans use uh, that I heard growing up, ABC, American born Chinese, right? And so people like my parents would say to people like me, you ABCs, you know, you, you don't do this, you don't do that. But ABC standing for American born Chinese, right? Uh, again, American born Chinese has by implication this notion that I am essentially indelibly, wherever I may reside, wherever I may happen to have been born, Chinese, right? I, I'm, I'm an American-born Chinese-American, right? That's a different thing. Uh, American-born Chinese uh, 
uh, is sort of a, is a dream. I mean, it is a wish. It is a wish, perhaps, in the first immigrant generation that uh, their children born here would remain essentially, fundamentally, unchangeably Chinese, though they were born here. And it is a dream that I think any immigrant parent realizes is only a dream, because from minute one in your arrival here, in your entry to schools, in your play with neighbors, uh, in your you know, walk in public spaces, uh, you become something other than what was Chinese in China. Uh, and that's both sad and beautiful. That's, that's the point. <clears throat> yes. non-Asian, don't you think that for non-Asian Americans, you and I will always be Chinese hyphen Americans mm -hmm. or American born Chinese? Uh, how often do you have total strangers asking you in the elevator mm -hmm. or in the grocery line, uh, where are you from? Where are you really from? Mm -hmm. Where are you really from is one of the most pointed and frequently asked questions uh, directed at not just Chinese, at Asian Americans in general, right? Um, and I, you are right that even to this day, um, you know, in American society, people with this face uh, are often presumed foreign until proven otherwise, right? Th that, that is true on one level. It is also true that that is changing, right? And it changes, this is something that, um, you know, in, again, in my work on citizenship and civic engagement, uh, I make a big point of talking about. It changes to the extent that we show up. It changes to the extent that we get out into the public square and claim voice. It changes to the extent that we um, get involved in culture and culture making, uh, that we are not just on TV, but that we are writing TV shows. It changes to the extent that we are writing books. It changes to the extent that we are entering professions. It changes to the extent that we are like one of my friends and mentors, Gary Locke, entering into politics and rep literally representing the United States uh, abroad, right? Uh, so that uh, not only does he make history by being the first Chinese-American US ambassador to China, but he changes how people throughout the world have to begin to visualize what's an American, right? I, I don't disagree that whether abroad or even among our countrymen here in the United States, that too many people, if you do the quick word association game and you say American, the picture that pops in their head is of a white man, not you or me, right? Uh, but that is changing. I think about my daughter's generation, uh, and it's already changing more there. Their notion of the where are you really from thing is, is less pointed and less salient in the lives of her generation uh, than it is in, in mine or yours. And it will be, I think, less so in her children's generation, right? Uh, but I don't just kind of leave it to time. Uh, and trust that it'll all work out you know, in, in the long run, because as John Maynard Keynes once said, in the long run, we're all dead, right? Uh, what, what I'm interested is in, in the here and the now, how we actually try to change our norms and the way we see each other and talk to each other. And part of that is educating our non-Asian American uh, friends, neighbors, fellow citizens uh, about the ways in which we are American. Uh, and part of that is um, just being present uh, in the fullest way possible that forces them to change their, uh, uh, their mental picture. So back. Hi, Eric. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Jenny Liu. No relation, I don't think. And I work as part of the communications team here at New America. Um, just thinking about, I came here to the US with my parents when I was two years old. So I guess that makes me a Chinese-born American, CBA. Um, but one episode in which I observed kind of the duality of both cultures present in my own parents was when the Sichuan earthquake happened. And my parents and the other Chinese at the Chinese American church that they go to um, all gather together to donate money and um, send relief funds over and just help in whatever way they could. Um, so I felt that in that instance, they all really identified as Chinese and um, feeling a lot of empathy and compassion for their compatriots. But the place, a church, um, the means through which they gave through collective donations and the motivation to be a good Christian we're all very um, kind of Western American notions. Um, so I don't know if you had any comment or observation about um, kind of civic associations or religious associations within the US that have helped Chinese Americans to both um, kind of identify with their Chineseness, but express them through like Western ways. That's a great both question and I think example. 
uh, of something, of, of this fusion uh, of styles, uh, uh, but, uh, but also uh, of the ways in which, yeah, particularly in crisis, something like the earthquake, um, or in moments, for instance, of, um, you know, uh, during the Beijing Olympics, I think many, particularly first generation Chinese immigrant, um, immigrants in the United States, you know, there was a strong pull and tug of pride and connection. Um, uh, and yet at the same time, you're absolutely right that the ways that in American life that that gets expressed are through channels, civic associations, self-organizing, faith groups uh, that are Tocquevillian. Right? that are what Alexis de Tocqueville described as classically American uh, and the ways in which American citizenship is and America's civic culture uh, is so unique uh, in the world. Um, I think there are a lot of other organizations out there. I mean, there are um, more professionalized advocacy organizations, of course. Uh, OCA, Organization of Chinese Americans, um, does a great deal of work both nationally and in chapters around the country. Um, and a lot of their work actually is essentially um, in kind of a watchdog way, kind of watching out for instances of mistaken identity, instances of discrimination, instances of you know, abuse and so forth. Um, there are other groups like the Chinese American Citizens Associ Alliance, CACA, um, uh, that have been working both to uh, uh, organize and activate uh, Chinese Americans uh, socially and civically, but particularly around using as the linchpin elements of history. Right? And so they've been behind a big drive to get more American um, history and government courses here in the United States to teach more about the Chinese exclusion law and the experience of uh, Chinese exclusion from 1882 all the way through 1943. Um, you know, at that point, for, for, for about a quarter of the life of the republic at that time, um, that a group, uh, you know, in the first and only instance of its kind, uh, had been barred entry into the territory of the United States on the basis of its race, right? And that this age of Chinese exclusion is this um, remarkable thing uh, in American history, a, a remarkable example of the ways in which we continually fall short of our stated creed and yet try continually to redeem that creed later uh, by reforming uh, and redressing uh, the, 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 these wrongs and injustices um, CACA is trying to embed that into our ed education system. Um, you know, here in the greater DC area, my, my mom is part of uh, something called CAPA, the Chinese American Professionals Association, um, which is uh, very active here in the greater DC area. Um, a huge network of people, uh, again, networking professionally, but also uh, civically and socially. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at, uh, Mike and I were talking before we came downstairs, just kind of thinking about how strong or how brittle is China today, right? This big question of, for as, as much as we Americans fear um, that China is going to eclipse America and so forth, um, how strong are they actually? And one of the ways in which I would say China is less strong than some people think um, is the thinness of their civic life, the absence of habits of association, the absence of permission to associate, uh, the absence of habits to, uh, from the bottom up in small circles, to solve problems yourselves uh, as citizens without waiting for someone else uh, or waiting for some entity uh, to do that, right? Now that is beginning to change as, uh, as things in China change, but um, you know, we in America see the bright, shiny, formidable exterior of a lot of chi China Inc. and China um, the, the kind of global empire force, right? And what we don't see is how when it comes to civic life and these habits of people in a bottom-up, sideways way um, making things work for themselves and solving things, um, you know, how relatively thin uh, that is there. Uh, although, again, the reason why I do what I do and run this organization called Citizen University um, is not to pat ourselves on the back here in the United States, but to warn us that it's getting thin here, too. Uh, and we are neglecting that, too our social capital and our stocks of civic capital uh, here in America, and that's something that we've got to tend to as well. We have one question over here. <clears throat> uh, I'm Julia Chain Block of the U.S. China Education Trust. I'd like to go back to your points about the rising China and the growing competition between the United States and China. Uh, I think we all know that U.S.-China relations have deteriorated to a really a very low spot. 
particularly over the uh, East China and South China Seas tensions. What do you think is the role of Chinese Americans in this growing uh, competition? Mm. Do you think Chinese Americans should have a role? And where are those voices in terms of this, uh, I think, intensifying debate? Um, and looking at our own history, I think we all agree with you. Uh, we hope that you know, the United States doesn't blow it. Yeah. Looking at our ho history, what do you think is the future mm. of Chinese in America or Chinese Americans? May, may I actually initially at least turn the question back to you because y you have, as uh, some of you may know, uh, a wealth of experience uh, as a diplomat, as a uh, leader in American um, foreign policy and uh, you know, I, I know this, I know your name. <laughs> uh, and as truly, literally a representative of the United States um, with a face like ours uh, and a voice like ours. And so I'm very curious, just first, your thoughts on the role of Chinese Americans in kind of helping uh, what, in this period of chi China-America competition. Well, for speaking from my own personal experience, you really put me on, on the spot. <laughs> uh, um, I created the U.S. China Education Trust back in 1998 uh, when I retired uh, at Peking University because I saw a gap. Um, there are quite a few uh, American organizations and societies that are focused on helping Americans understand China and the Chinese. But I really couldn't find any that were helping the Chinese understand the United States or understand America. And I was in a, in a unique spot and was given an opportunity to really do something about it because we all know Peking University. It is the Harvard of China. Uh, just as Tsinghua is the you know, MIT of the United States. Uh, so what I thought over all these years since 1998 is that Chinese Americans can be a bridge because in many ways, as you said, we are not so much assimilated as we are acculturated. So we are really uh, of both cultures. So I think uh, the Chinese, from my experience again, the Chinese uh, welcome uh, Chinese Americans in particular to um, be the interlocutor, if you will, be the intermediary between our two societies because they think, uh, although sometimes or often they're disappointed, that uh, Chinese Americans may have more of an inclination, a greater understanding uh, towards China and the Chinese. Mm. So it's very interesting. I, I would agree with mo almost all of that, and, and, uh, and one phrase in particular to draw out, though they may be disappointed, right? Um, it, it, it does bring me back to my friend Gary Locke, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so what, as you may remember, right, when Gary Locke was, uh, you know, I'm from Seattle, when Gary was governor of Washington, uh, he made this triumphant uh, tour of China, visited his ancestral homeland village uh, where his grandfather had emigrated from, you know, and, and this great American story. His grandfather had come from that village, come to the United States, been a houseboy um, in a private home a mile from the governor's mansion. And then two generations later, his grandson is governor of Washington state, right? Uh, and so in the late 90s, Locke went back to China and was greeted as this hero. Uh, you know, fast forward a bit, he becomes uh, commerce secretary and then United States ambassador to China. When he first, um, uh, took the post as ambassador to China, there was, the, the first reaction was similarly kind of praising and uh, adulation and what a hero, right? Um, uh, and some of you may remember, uh, literally even before Gary left the territory of the United States, when he was at the airport in SeaTac, um, he was at a Starbucks uh, and he was wearing a backpack, carrying his own bags, uh, and some uh, uh, tourist or somebody snapped a picture of him saying, hey, that's ambassador Gary Locke, he's carrying his own bags. And that picture went viral in China, right? And it went viral um, in part to kind of praise him, what a humble, you know, uh, low-key guy, but really as an indirect way uh, for people in China to criticize uh, the cronyism and corruption of a lot of leadership class there, um, who never carry their own bags, who are getting driven around in Audis and Mercedes, who, you know, uh, so and so, who, whose princelings are getting to kind of do whatever they want, 
in society. And so there was this kind of use of Locke as a way to kind of indirectly criticize. Then fast forward to when he takes the job, right? And guess what? His job turns out not to be purely the bridge of understanding between two cultures. His job, the job description of the United States ambassador is to represent the interests and values of the United States. And where that came into tension with the interests and values of the People's Republic of China, um, many people in China were, sh were shocked. They were surprised. And so you know, when uh, 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 Chen Guangchen, the, the, the blind dissident, um, you know, wanted to escape China uh, and Locke got in the middle of uh, arranging um, you know, his exit from uh, China. Uh, when uh, other economic or military disputes arose uh, as China has been flexing its muscles in the South China Sea, all of a sudden people in China started saying about Locke, wait a minute, you're not one of us. You're a race traitor. You know, what kind of Chinese are you? you know? uh, and when he left the job as ambassador, um, an organ of Chinese state media uh, published an editorial uh, mocking him and saying he's a banana. Right? He's yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. Right? Uh, and he never had any real sympathy for China and uh, good riddance. Right? I looked at that editorial and I thought, wow, again, that says a lot about how little to, to what uh, you know, Ambassador Block is uh, uh, describing in her work, you know, how little China actually understands America. Uh, because Gary Locke was not a banana. Right? G G G Gary, Gary Locke's job in representing the interests of the United States didn't make him white inside. It made him American inside. Right? And their inability to distinguish between white and American uh, is precisely um, the kind of narrow vision that gives America an edge in the world. Right? And so you know, to, to more directly answer the question, I, I do think that Chinese Americans today, in many ways, can be bridges of understanding. Uh, are already bridges of understanding. I mean, you think about um, in, in business, in whether large-scale corporate deal-making or smaller-scale uh, you know, entrepreneurialism, um, the, the flow of Chinese-American uh, business and talent and understanding is, is thick and thickening. Um, I, I think that's true also in policy, whether foreign policy or even you know, education policy and, and, and bridge building that way. Uh, uh, that said, um, I think um, you know, I bear in mind the caveat of they, they may be disappointed, right? And I think the best job that we Chinese Americans can do is to show people in China how we are American. To show them how we are American and how being American and how the full variety of ways of being American um, uh, you know, embodies the full diversity and range of ways that a person can be a person uh, in America, right? And, uh, sometimes that will mean having Chinese Americans be interlocutors at programs like the one that you've set up at, uh, uh, at Beida. Uh, and other times that will mean simply uh, uh, having us be voices and examples um, uh, so that they understand m in a more three-dimensional way the way that we in America deal with race and identity um, and belonging and culture and, and to give them a more complex picture um, than, they, than a lot of them it seems currently have uh, in their heads. I think that's one of the best things we can do. We'll take two more questions. Uh, the, the gentleman with the tie and uh, the gentleman with the short sleeve blue shirt. Thank you, Eric Liu. Uh, that's a wonderful book. And my name is James and Chen. And I was born in China, and, but I have family and raised my kids here. And uh, I often think about, reflect the old culture that I was brought up in a village uh, <laughs> um, 40 years ago. And I also, when I, after I moved to America, I lived in Princeton for a while. I have a very good Princeton professor whose um, family immigrant here from Germany. They still call their grandma Oma. Mm -hmm. But besides that, I can't tell anything different from this American to other German, American, American, German. But at the same time, I noticed the Jewish Americans or Jews, they, they always call them Jews they uh, stick to their own culture, Jewish culture, language, very, very much. A as we all know that many American Jews here support Israel so much, as you can tell by the hearing of the um, Secretary of Defense, <laughs> and he was brutal by those who support Israel for his, a few remarks actually about 
a Jewish lobbying and actually the American lobby and in support of uh, Israel. And at the same time that we are talking about the Chinese American, and uh, there are certain different group of, like you were talking about the second generation, like Gary, um, I completely agree with him, what he was doing in China as ambassador of the United States, defending or representing American value and, and uh, defending American uh, interest. But at the same time, there are other groups who tend to identify themselves more Chinese than American. Uh, I'm not one of them, uh, and I can't see my children will be any way to be non-American, non but, but this is a kind of culture identity. So I wonder uh, how do you read uh, the culture factor um, that make yeah. Jewish American more successful or American Chinese more okay. successful. So, uh, yeah. One more Thank question and then you can answer okay, both of great. them, okay? And last question? No, 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 uh, the, the guy in the short sleeves there. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, well, we'll take. The one in the blue shirt. Oh, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Who, who, did, you, who did you mean? We'll take both questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering about language and uh, if you feel as, as a father, for example, that your access to your Chinese heritage is greater enhanced by your understanding of whatever dialect your your parents spoke. Do you think your your daughter or generations that might be farther apart and not have that language access, do you think they have as much of a claim to their Asian heritage? Great question. Okay. Great last question. Thank you. Um, I think your point that hybridity in America gives the country an advantage is an interesting one. Um, and I wanted to get your opinion on what makes America special that allowed this hybridity to develop and evolve um, and how it survived uh, previous examples of what we might s see as isolationism and restrictionism, I think, the terms you used. Great. Well, um, uh, Actually, can we bring the mic? To, uh, th th this woman in the second row was, was really eager to, to yeah. say, so just a a add your question to the mix and I'll try to wrap it all up. Thank you. Um, I was raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, which is a predominantly Asian American state of all 50 states, as well as Barack Obama. And I wanted to know your opinion on the statement um, that Barack Obama is the first Asian American president <laughs> of the United States <laughs> because he had Right. White rice every day. He was. He was. His friends, his teachers, yep. are Asian Americans. Yeah. Your Just point. like people used to say that my former boss, Bill Clinton, was the first African American president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so let me actually, in reverse order, we weave these together. That, that statement itself, that Barack Obama was our first Asian American president, that Bill Clinton was our first black president. Um, you know, they're jokes, but they have a kernel of truth, and the kernel of truth is exactly to this point of hybridity. This point of um, not just that we are tolerant of um, new people coming in, but that we let ourselves be changed by new people coming in, right? Um, so that um, neither Barack Obama's father from Kenya uh, nor the you know, people of various Asian ethnicities around him in, in Hawaii necessarily expected that they would inform and infuse one another, but it happened, right? Um, and you know, Bill Clinton growing up in, in rural Arkansas, you know, um, uh, didn't expect to be understood as the first black president, but it happened because that's who he grew up around and with and from the time he was a child understood to be, um, this, is, uh, this is my neighbor, this is my fellow citizen, right? Um, uh, you know, th this question of what accounts for this history of hybridity um, uh, again, I, I keep on plugging it, but I would, number one, refer you to Mike's book, uh, The Next American Nation, which great, does give you a great sense of kind of the exceptional and, and in some ways unique historical circumstances um, uh, th th that allowed us to forge this culture of, uh, of openness. Um, uh, but again, not to, over, not to put too great a shine on it, um, for a lot of this country's history, that openness was very conditional. And it was conditional on being one of the least despised versions of white people available, right? Um, and so uh, pe people's openness was only open so far as, okay, I, you know, Germans, yeah, all right. 
Uh, Italians, eh, not so much, right? Um, you know, uh, Italians maybe. Irish, I don't know. Irish are a different race, right? They're not even quite human, right? There's a lot of that kind of ethic for many of the, you know, first part, first century of this century and a half of this country's history, um, uh, and so you know the idea that uh, non-Europeans, you know, the melting pot. The idea of the melting pot uh, is also a, a phrase that I essentially discard now because it describes a moment in time when different kinds of Europeans could come here and become white, right? Um, when Germans and Irish and Italians and Greeks uh, could set aside their previous historical ancient kind of hatreds and tribal differences and just mush into this kind of monochrome whiteness. Uh, and that is the underside of this American story, right? Because part of how they became white is they define themselves as not black. When the Irish first came here in large numbers, poor Irish immigrants, and Mike knows this just as well, you know, they were despised by the Anglo-Yankee kind of native stock of America. Um, they were held in the same kind of social isolation as um, freed slaves, as African Americans in our community. And they worked side by side. They lived side by side. They intermingled. They intermarried for a kind of short window of time until enough Irish arrived that they figured out our way up on the ladder is to step on the blacks, right? And to say, we are not black. We distance ourselves from the black. We will show our chops by pushing against the blacks, uh, and we will earn our stripes as white, right? That, part of, that, that is as much a part of American history of inclusion and openness uh, as simply my kind of Whitman-esque song of hybridity, right? Um, and, and I think we have to hold both of these truths uh, in our head at the same time. Um, uh, uh, and I think, you know, you know, to, to um, this question about um, why certain ethnic groups in this, uh, in this country, in the immigrant panorama, have held more to an ancestral culture, you know, in particular Jewish Americans, um, you know, it's a chicken and egg, uh, I suppose, of um, the more fiercely you are discriminated against, <laughs> the more you tend to hold on to the culture um, that you came here with, right? That, that has certainly been the Jewish experience uh, globally, right? Um, and, uh, and, and there is this chicken and egg thing when Chinese immigrants first started to arrive in significant, significant enough numbers to form Chinatowns. They formed Chinatowns because they weren't, let, they weren't allowed to live anywhere else. They weren't allowed to just move into um, you know, neighborhoods of whites. Uh, and, but then once there were Chinatowns, then it became this self-fulfilling thing of, oh, those clannish Chinese, they keep to themselves, they don't want to be part of the rest of society, and they've got weird customs, they don't integrate, they don't assimilate. What's wrong with them, right? Uh, amnesiac, forgetting that, well, they were sort of put there. They were ghettoized there by the wider society, right? Um, I think that was, in early generations, part of the Jewish story uh, in America as well. Uh, actually, I would say that you know, today the greater concern among Jewish Americans is not uh, 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 the fact that they stand apart in holding on to their uh, culture and, and religious heritage. It, it is that rapid intermarriage is eroding and evaporating that heritage um, today. I mean, that's the fear that you hear in, in Jewish communities all across the United States. Um, which brings me to you know, the, the, the first and last question here about language. Um, language. Um, and cultural inheritance in general. Um, you know, my, my, com I, my command, such as it is, of Mandarin is not, you know, I, I'm barely proficient, um, you know, in, in conversational Chinese. My reading and writing are very poor. Um, and I'm probably the worst of my cousins, you know, at, at this. My, you know, my, my, my cousins are more fluent in, in written and spoken uh, Chinese than I am. Uh, and so I already have a degraded command. And what I'm passing on to the third generation, to my daughter, will be further degraded still, right? Um, I, I, I tried from the time she was little to send her to Chinese school the way that my mom sent me to Chinese school, and she resisted even more than I did. And, uh, but I struck a deal with her that said, look, um, if I'm not going to send you to this weekly Chinese school, which I admit is very kind of boring and not well done and everything, um, then you have to do a tutorial with me once a week. Um, and she agreed to that, um, starting at age, you know, eight roughly or, or, or nine. Uh, and 
we haven't been religious about it every week, but we have been doing it for all those years since. Um, and I use every bit that I can. I use textbooks from when I was a kid. I use textbooks from when I was in college and took refresher courses uh, in Mandarin. Uh, and I dust these things off. And, uh, and we play games and invent games where I get to teach her things in, in more creative ways. Uh, and yes, I mean, I think language is a key to accessing so much about a culture and a civilization. Right? And one thing that I'm very grateful for, even though my daughters, even though Olivia's uh, Chinese, you know, she could barely um, uh, carry on a conversation, but she has enough so that, uh, number one, her pronunciation is excellent. Number two, she has, what she's developed are instincts. She has an instinct for when a character is drawn right or wrong. She has an instinct, in Chinese, in the writing of Chinese characters, there is an order to the strokes, right? If there's a shape that's like a box, you can't just draw it any which way, four sides. There's a way that starts on the left, and then this way like that, and then you close the bottom, right? She has an instinct for how you literally draw the characters. She has an instinct in, for Chinese sentence structure, right? Um, which differs from English sentence structure, and, and, and where you put subjects and verbs, and how Chinese that, as a language that lacks so many prepositions and kind of the interconnective tissue that we have in English, she has an instinct for how you compose things, right? Uh, uh, that to me, like she can, if she gets interested in five, ten years, she can ramp up and study and build her vocabulary up, right? But you can't reteach those instincts, um, you know, 20 years from now. And I'm very glad that she has those instincts because to me they also signify a larger set of instincts about the culture. A language that lacks prepositions, for instance, um, uh, forces you to understand meaning by context, right? Forces you to understand the relation of words to one another and the relation of that sentence to the larger conversation. That is a Chinese way of thinking, a contextual way of thinking. It is not about spelling out in the precisest detail kind of exactly what you mean um, as legalistic Americans and you know, English speakers like to do. It is about understanding the gestalt, to, to cite our German friends, right? Uh, and that is a way of being and thinking that some knowledge of the Chinese language allows her to appreciate about the Chinese culture and way of thinking, right? Um, it's some of what I try to write about and explore in the book. And, um, and you know, yes, ultimately you're right that that degrades over time. Uh, and that is, again, both the sadness and the beauty of American life because even as that degrades, other new things are flowering, right? And she is borrowing styles from her African-American friends and from her Jewish friends and from her Native American friends and other people where she's mixing languages and ways of being and talking um, that she would never have had access to had she grown up Chinese in China. Um, and that's, that is the trade-off we make as Americans. And our job is to just make that trade as open-minded and open-hearted uh, as we can together. And that, in the end, was um, why I tried to offer this book up. Well, the book is A Chinaman's Chance. Please join me in thanking uh, Eric Liu. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much.